If you were to ask me what got me into biology, I'd probably give you two different answers. The first answer was how I chose bio for a degree to pursue in university. At the time, I was stuck deciding between nuclear physics, theater, and genetics, and couldn't pick. Yeah, I know, it's an eclectic mix. Around then, I was getting into Studio Ghibli movies, and I happened to watch Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind. I only made it about halfway through before I knew bio was what I wanted most at the time, and right then I put in my application. There was something about the trees fossilizing and rendering all the pollution harmless that has just stuck with me. Even though I never finished the degree, I still think it was the right choice. But the second answer was how I even got interested in bio in the first place. My high school biology teacher was the absolute worst. It was easily the most excruciatingly boring class I ever took, and I'm counting the anthropology class I took in uni, which is a close second. So as we approached exam season, I had an issue. I just couldn't will myself to care enough to actually study. Not wanting to fail, knowing that it was important, I set out to find some way to interest myself, so I did what I always do, and started learning on my own outside of class. The thing that finally hooked me was the day that I learned that certain species of fungi can glow in the dark. I'd always loved fireflies, but had no idea that other organisms can glow too. This was the beginning of my fascination with bioluminescence that has never really gone away. To that end, now that the lab is up and running and I'm an adult and can do what I like, I've gone out of my way to source as many glowing organisms as I could, and thus far my collection is up to three, with more in the works. I've already got a script for the first episode about one of these written, but I wanted something more than just a test tube full of bacteria, as that wouldn't really be nice to look at for the ten or so minutes it'll take to explain how the glow works. So as I was sitting there trying to think of some way to show off the glow, I realized that there was another project I've wanted to build that could work perfectly. That project is a bioreactor. A bioreactor is basically just a big tank that has a few ports to allow for air input and exhaust, as well as nutrient input and waste removal. What makes them great is that if you attach some pumps to the various lines, you can essentially make an infinite amount of whatever you're growing, so long as you slowly drip in food and pull out small amounts of product. There are lots of great bioreactor designs, and I've shown one off briefly in a previous video. My friend David Ishii, who you should absolutely go subscribe to, built himself a 5-gallon bioreactor to churn out DNA for one of his projects, and as a test to show that it works, he grew 5 gallons of glowing bacteria. This is what gave me the idea for my own reactor. But I don't need 5 gallons of E. coli growing in the lab, and would prefer a more manageable amount of liquid. So rather than a 5-gallon carboy, I picked up this kerosene lantern, as I thought what better to show off glowing bacteria with. In this video, we're going to go through the build process of the reactor itself, and then in a future video, we'll build a small pumping unit to allow that infinite production I mentioned before. I've got some fun ideas for that once it's built, but that's a topic for another time. Today, we'll just build the basics and give it a test run, so that way we can come back to the bioluminescent bacteria in a couple of weeks. First up, the lantern needed to be taken apart to make room for the tubing, air pump, and electronics, as well as to convert the glass piece into the main reactor chamber. After removing the wick assembly and as much of the internal workings as I could, as well as the top lid, I could start working on the main chamber. I removed the glass carefully and started working on a top and bottom for it. The bottom piece will be physically attached to the glass, but the top part will be part of the lantern, so we'll need something that the glass can press onto to seal it. For the bottom plug, I went with a sheet of 4mm aluminum that I cut out with a bandsaw and then cleaned up with a grinding wheel and some files. This was then secured to the glass using high temperature silicon gasket sealant, which I normally use for making lids for fungi growing. I figured I'd use this so that if I ever felt like autoclaving this I could, but realized after that the expanding metal would probably shatter the glass, so I'll probably never use that functionality. While that was curing, I cut a big hole in the bottom of the lantern and removed the kerosene tank to leave lots of room for the electronics. I removed the kerosene filling cap and widened the hole to accept a nice switch, and made a second hole next to it to fit a second switch, though I didn't add these till the end. For the top plug, I found this block of what I think is Delrin, but is probably some other hard plastic. I roughed out the basic shape and then made a small hole that doesn't go all the way through right in the middle. This is so that I can fit a rod in here to act as a mandrel so I can mount the plastic on the lathe, since I don't have a chuck that could otherwise hold this. With a bit of tailstock support, this was actually very turnable. I had measured the inner diameter of the lantern's top section and after truing up the plastic, brought it to final dimension. I had to take the plastic off a couple of times to check the fit to make sure it fit nicely with a bit of gap so that I could glue this in place. To help it hold, I carved a few channels into the plastic so that the glue had something to grip onto. With the part shaped, I could drill a bunch of holes for the air input and exhaust, nutrient feed and waste removal lines, and then half a dozen holes for UV LEDs. I figured these could be fun if I grow fluorescent proteins in here and could help with sterilization if I just left them on for a while while the system is empty. Since this would be awkward to work with once it was mounted in the lantern, I mounted all the tubing and LEDs, as well as wiring them all up. 
After trimming the tubing to length, I also added an air stone to the air intake, and a lure lock connector to act as a weight for the fluid removal line so that it sits at the bottom of the container. Because I wanted the whole system to be very portable so I could easily show it off and move it around even when it's fully loaded, I picked up a tiny air pump to fit into the top, but it was still a bit too tall to leave enough room for the tubing and wiring and such. So I modified the lid of the lantern to fit the pump's motor, and then made a cap out of an old film canister to cover and protect it. After that, everything could get a quick coat of paint before assembly so that all the scuff marks and machining errors were mostly hidden. I'd considered doing green for a green lantern look, but didn't have the budget for a terrible CGI costume to go with it, and ended up just going with more red. I think it preserves the look of the lantern, which I think adds to the aesthetic. Finally, having the patience of a monk that somebody slipped a handful of caffeine pills, I started assembling everything while the paint was still a little bit wet, because I am not a smart man. First, the plug could be mounted to the lantern using some hot glue. To make sure this was as close of a fit to the glass as possible, I quickly added the tank and closed everything up so that it would dry in place. The hot glue also formed a nice gasket that the glass can fit into when this closes up. Then I could focus on the wiring, so the two wires for the LEDs were fed down one of the arms of the lantern, leaving a bit of slack so that the lantern mechanism could still work. That way I can get the glass chamber back into place later. Then I permanently mounted the pump and wires into the lid, and repeated the same wiring method as before, but with the other arm of the lantern. I didn't feed them all the way until the very end so that I could do all the tubing and stuff. Speaking of which, I chose one of the larger vent holes to have everything mount through. I used some double-sided lure lock adapters I had laying around to act as connections for attaching the pump lines later, and for the gases I added two brass valves. The final connections were between the input line and the air pump, and then the air pump to the brass valve. This step was a bit finicky as I had to pull the wires through and all the tubing in place at all at the same time so that everything fit together nicely. Finally, the switches were wired up and a battery pack was added. These batteries won't last nearly long enough to make this really useful, they're just here so that when I want to show this off and move it around, I can. Off camera, I eventually added a wired power supply so that this can run all day long without issue. And that's really all there is to it. These are exceptionally simple devices. I really overcomplicated it for the sake of the visual. But I think it was worth it as this looks amazing sitting on the desk in the lab. For a first fluid and air test, I filled the chamber with water using the main fluid intake port and a syringe which took ages because I was doing it by hand. But I wanted to make sure that this all worked properly. For later test, I just open up the system and pour in the liquids. I also added some highlighter fluid to the water to give it a glowing green tinge which looked amazing with the UV lights on. After fixing a small leak, I was ready to give this a proper test run. The last things were to add an inline HEPA filter to the air intake, and a carbon filter to the exhaust so my lab doesn't reek of E. coli. The carbon filter I just made out of two lure lock connectors and a 15 mil falcon tube, which I then filled with activated charcoal. This is nice because it's easy to refill and a small piece of paper towel on the bottom is all that's required to prevent the charcoal from leaking out. To get everything ready for bacteria, this needs to be sterilized, so I used hydrogen peroxide to flush all the lines, and clean the inner chamber. I chose peroxide for this because it's cheap and it's great for killing spores and bacteria, but on contact with the nutrient medium, it'll quickly react away, so that once we add the organism we want, they won't get harmed. You can optionally flush the lines with sterile water if you really want to make sure the peroxide is gone. Once everything has sat in peroxide for a while, I drained it as much as I could so the system was empty and ready for bacteria. Speaking of which, for this test I chose some E. coli that produce red fluorescent protein which glows vibrant orange under UV light. The nice part about these is they require ampicillin as a selection agent in the media, which also helps keep contamination down. I'm just using normal LB with ampicillin in it, and it didn't take long for the bacteria to quickly take over the medium, and after a day the solution was so murky it couldn't be seen through anymore. Even then it took a while before the reddish color developed, but that's normal. I think this project was a big success, and I'm super excited to use this for all sorts of upcoming projects anytime I need a lot of an organism, or want to have a reaction that just runs continuously. When we eventually get the spider silk project working, I'll definitely be using this to churn out buckets of silk protein to play with. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the upcoming bioluminescence videos, spider silk, and so much more. Speaking of spider silk, if you haven't seen them yet, I added two new poster designs to my store to celebrate and help support the project. So if you're interested, I've put links to these and my other designs in the description. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I've also linked to a whole playlist of videos covering all the steps of the Spider Silk project we've completed thus far, including the first episode where I explain it. And that's where I'll end this episode. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and channel members who make these videos possible. And if you'd like to see these projects long before they end up in videos, be sure to head over to my other social media pages, especially Instagram. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.